It was that truly great American, Abraham Lincoln, who shared this marvellous insight. Nearly all men can stand adversity, but if you want to test a man's character, give him power. All of us, from the earliest years of our life, learn that fire can be a great blessing, but also an utterly destructive agent. Sex is the most beautiful expression of love between appropriate lovers, but it can also lead to utter devastation by the careless. Water, fame, food, work, religion, power, sex, fire, and so, so much more, they all have within them the potential for both blessing and curse. Wisdom knows how to enjoy the blessing and keep the curse caged. Such wisdom though does not come naturally. It has to be learned. The great teacher Jesus of Nazareth used parables to teach and pass on his wonderful wisdom. The subject matter of today's parable is wealth and of its place within the faithful community. The first thing to notice is that wealth is not denigrated by Jesus. Jesus knew and enjoyed the company of wealthy people. He even allowed a woman to pour onto his feet an extremely valuable commodity and in such an eyebrow-raising quantity. Nevertheless, Jesus often spoke about the danger that wealth could pose. He never says that wealth is evil, but it is dangerous, especially for those who would be his disciple. It is dangerous because it so easily and constantly tempts us to desire more, and in doing so to flirt with the curse of greed. When that happens, accumulating more and more starts to become the most important thing in life. That's the reason Jesus warns us to be on our guard against all kinds of greed. Beware of the consuming destruction of life by avarice, that insatiable desire for more, because it only leads to a false understanding of life and a false foundation for life. All around us, we are assaulted with lies about wealth. Lie number one is this, the more you have, the more you are worth. Wealth tempts us to believe the lie that whoever owns the most barns is the winner. So much of our culture and our economy is based upon this lie. Too great a part of our society values those who have more above those who have not. When a wealthy person gets killed, it becomes shocking front page news. But the murder of a poor person is so commonplace, it hardly deserves a mention. The world teaches that the value of a person's life is measured by the size of their net worth. But Jesus teaches us that is a lie. Each and every person is endowed with worth. Eternal worth is the gift that each one of us receives by the merits of Jesus. We can choose to live out of that understanding of life or not. But we cannot add to the worth that we already have through Jesus Christ, least of all, by the size of our bank balance. Jesus teaches us to measure ourselves and others by God's standards. Life, it is so much more 
than possessions. Lie number two is this. Wealth tempts us to believe that we have earned what we have. The man in the parable said, Soul, you have laid up ample goods for your future. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. The man in the parable was a man who had had an exceptionally good year in business. Notice also there's no suggestion that he cheated anyone or that he had mistreated his workers or had been in any way unjust. When his harvest exceeded the capacity of his barns, he built bigger barns. He was thinking ahead like a good businessman or woman. He was planning for the future. He had worked hard and now he was looking forward to a well-earned rest. He was proud of all that he had accomplished and ready to enjoy the fruits of his labour. But this man had fallen into the trap of another lie. My fruits, he called them. My grain. But in what sense were they his? Could he command the sap in the tree or the fertility of the soil? Were the sunrise and the sunset under his control? Was the faithfulness of returning seasons to his merit? If the rain had been withheld, where then would be his wealth? The land produced abundantly. All the man could do was to take nature's tides at the flood. He was carried to fortune in grace, in the light, the heat and the constancy in nature's cycles, which are boundless mysteries of blessing. And he called them mine. But Jesus called him a fool. This man was ready to take credit for all the benefits he enjoyed without any apparent awareness of the Creator's contributions or those of anyone else, not least his parents, who brought him into the world and nurtured him to adulthood. The teachers and the mentors who sharpened his mind and taught him the skills of farming. Those workers who ploughed his field, harvested his crops and probably built his barns. And of course, his ancestors who acquired the land that he would later inherit. <clears throat> when we have been successful in accumulating wealth, it is so easy to believe the lie that we have earned all that we have. But each of us has received countless blessings that we did not do a thing to deserve. And we will be accountable for how we use them. Like the rich man, we may be tempted to call them mine, but that is to be seduced by a lie. Lie number three is this. What matters is taking care of number one. The man in the parable seemed to know a lot about taking care of number one. He used the pronouns I and my six times each in this short parable. This was a man who was engaged in a monologue. He talked to himself. He planned for himself. He congratulated himself. Celebrated himself. He was an egotist with no apparent thought for God or for anyone else. He never considered who else might benefit from a small share of his bounty. What about the workers who helped to harvest his land? What about the needy in his community, or even in his own family? Was there no sickness to be healed? No nakedness to be clothed? No, here is a man whose thought was only for himself. And when the only thing that matters is taking care of number one, our interests become narrowed, our sympathies wither, and our imaginations become deadened to other people's needs. Our world gets very small 
And our own counsel is the only one we consult, the only one we will trust. The man in the parable thought he was taking care of number one by stockpiling his wealth, but in the end, he lost not only his wealth, but everything that mattered. Lie number four is this, you can secure the future with wealth. The man in the parable, he thought he could secure his future in the possessions that he laid up for himself. He thought he was amply supplied for many years and decided that he'd finally made it. He could stop all the hard work, relax, eat, drink and be merry. This man was not a bad man. He was a fool, but he was not a bad man. By modern standards, he was a prudent man, a man who capitalised on his investments, who planned wisely for the future. Who of us, quite properly, doesn't do the same? With our savings accounts, our pension plans, our investments, our life insurances, and so on. Isn't it prudent to put something aside for the rainy day? Isn't it wise to keep an eye on the future? So, why did God call him a fool? He was a fool because he thought that the stockpiling of possessions gave him control over the future. This man sought security in the wrong place. He put his trust in things that could not last. The stockpiling of possessions against insecurity was not only an act of disregard for those in need, it was idolatry, putting possessions in the place of God. This man looked for meaning and control of his destiny through his wealth, but in the process he squandered his real treasure, life. So, that's what it is like for those who store up treasure for themselves, but are not rich toward God. The future cannot be secured with abundant possessions, because sooner or later, each one of us must face the limits of our time. When death knocks, each of us must answer for what we've done with the gift of life, and the treasures of life that we have inherited. Have we stored up treasures for ourselves, believing that life consists of possessions? Or have we sought to become rich towards God, as Jesus puts it? Jesus told this parable because he wanted us to recognise that life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. The pursuit of wealth as the meaning of life and the source of one's security, that leads only to a poverty of soul and a thin imitation of life. You may be a prized Olympic champion or a person born with no legs. You may be the brightest brain in the university or you may be brain damaged and confined to a life of being cared for. You may be a celebrated personality or you may be a despised prisoner serving a long jail sentence. The immortal person within each one of us is that composite of the soul and spirit and mind. The intellectual, emotional and volitional person within us. It is that immortal person within us which the death of the body cannot destroy. The essential being which has an everlasting relationship with God. Essential, abundant life is what God offers each one of us through Christ. When we pursue this life, when it is the source of our meaning and security, when it is the goal that we live for, 
and the means by which we seek to live, then we become rich towards God. Then we have the life that is more than possessions, the essential life, which can never be taken away from us.